All right, we're live. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Persuasion by the Pint. I'm Jonathan Taylor, along with Sean McCool. And Jonathan, today we've got a special guest in the green room. Um, man, this dude, he knows his stuff. So we're going to be talking about it. You're just going to go ahead and just pull it right out, huh? <laughs> Can't forget, help it. Forget the open loops or the teasers. We're just yeah, gonna go straight just into it, going right? straight into it. We've got David uh, Garfinkel. Yeah, he is so the, uh, is that how, me, am I saying that right? Yes. Let me read the bio since you already <laughs> just jumped right into it. Let's, uh, so this is such a good book. It is a good book. So we want to get to it as quickly as possible, but yeah, here's the, get your applause button queued up people. Yeah. David Garfinkel is author of the best selling the persuasion story code, which is what we'll be talking about today has been featured in the wall street journal, Forbes.com entrepreneur magazine, fast company, and the Los Angeles times among many other publications, but this is only a one hour show. So we'll have to stop it there. <laughs> David has worked with businesses ranging from IBM and United airlines to medium sized and small companies, as well as many one person businesses. He has helped them increase revenue overall by tens of millions of dollars, most notably through the effective use of copywriting and other persuasive messaging David is also the author of best-selling breakthrough copywriting, host of the popular copywriters podcast and former San Francisco bureau chief for McGraw Hill world news. Welcome to the show, David Garfinkel. Oh my God. A cast, uh, an audience yeah. of thousands. Hi guys. Yes, yes. <laughs> we, uh, we hire the best extras. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome on the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. yeah. So where are you at right now? What part of the world are you in, David? I'm in San Francisco. So you're still there. So yeah. you just never left, huh? Once you were no. there. Is um, it the weather? Because I mean, there, I mean, obviously, I know that that's, I've been out to San Francisco a few times before, and it's a beautiful area of the country. The weather's perfect. I'm always curious why people stay. Um, so what's your reason? Well, I, I think it's the weather and... Um, this is like really hard if you don't experience the world this way to understand, but there is um, a permission for creativity here. Yeah. Um, both entrepreneurial and much more subtle and uncategorizable. And I'm a really creative person. I grew up in uh, what is arguably the least creative town in the world washington dc <laughs> and uh, so yeah. it's kind of a reaction against my childhood too. <laughs> got it yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, you I nailed mean, that yeah, one some, something in the air in, in california in general and then you know the key big cities san diego la mm -hmm. san francisco maybe not as much oakland but you know definitely the big the big three have have that Mm -hmm. that energy kind of like austin does here austin's got that same kind of energy here yeah austin's a really cool place you yeah know, it's uh um but man is it hot here in the summer <laughs> so yes i can Are get you um of course you're not you're you're not a wine connoisseur so i was going to ask you you're up in the uh the wine oh, oh man i used to be and all of a sudden during the pandemic i stopped drinking i mean it yeah. wasn't like i said well now I'm, it's like i'm not gonna do this anymore i don't know why i don't want to right but, huh. Oh yeah, I used to go. Up I think most people country. took up drinking during the pandemic. <laughs> I know. I'm very <laughs> contrarian. What can I say? Yeah, yeah. trying to even out the, the thing there. <laughs> well, speaking of beverages, I know you're not having an alcoholic beverage, but what are you having? You you have a go-to yeah, drink I, now? I did not even open. I I decided to wait oh. to open it. I am having a Monster Ultra Rosa, and um, even read you a little bit from the can. It was great copy. Roses are red. Grapefruit is pink. Ultra Rosa is not what you think. So there you go. There you go. <laughs> Short and simple, uh, classic poetry there. I yeah. like it. Is that one of the uh, zero calorie ones? With the it, maybe zero or, or 10 calories. Um, yeah. Some have, a, yeah, this one has 10 calories. And is that the yeah. one? Is that the kind of can that has like the, you can literally feel the, the graphics on the can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like it's yeah. Like Maybe it, it may be in Braille, but I shouldn't say that because it's disrespectful. I don't know, yeah. but there's, there's something going on here that I don't understand. Yeah. It's like a, there's a tactileness to the, to the can that makes it kind of cool. So there Jonathan, is. Yeah. It's, it's kind of cool. It's kind of like Altoids in the paper and you know, the whole experience of it. So. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's not, I mean, Red Bull was too intense for me. I mean, I, I remember once, 
I went to a bar at a very fancy steakhouse and asked for a Red Bull and a couple of shots. And he said, no, no, we've had people have heart attacks for that. No. Don't. Wow. wow. Yeah. Red Bull and vodka, I think was a go-to drink you know, for yeah. a while or still is, I'm sure in the right crowds, but uh, so yeah. So Jonathan, what do you have over there? You said you, you had a classic you're bringing back to the show. I've got a repeat guest. Uh, this yeah. is a peanut butter milk stout nitro oh, from uh, left hand brewing company um you know it's it's really hard uh david sean and i review and we have so many beers on this show so it's really hard when you've had so many to choose from over the years to to yeah, find something that's original <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we just have to go back to uh some of our previous favorites and so i know i've probably rated this one pretty pretty high before but i always i love anything with peanut butter um i'm not big on the pumpkin uh ales and all of these pumpkin uh spice beers that are out right now so it's just hard to get on board some of those so i uh i went with a a go-to which is a peanut butter stout so there you go Th does uh, it really have peanut butter flavor actual peanut butter in it and it does it's like a reese's look it's like a reese's cup <laughs> it's got That's some great. chocolate uh, yeah the I first peanut in. butter stout i ever had was sweet baby jesus ah. and that was a really yeah. that was really good so i get that well mine um real quick here mine is from um lakewood brewery mm. so i'm having the s'mores temptress mm. and it Ooh. is wow. it is chocolate graham and marshmallows duff chocolate and graham aroma sweet finish available starting in may uh, so anyway, that's, that's, look, they have one, they have a double stuffed Oreo. Ooh. I've not been able to find that one yet, but if I can find that, it's coming on. Oh the show man, sure. that sounds amazing. How yeah. do they get a marshmallow in that can? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they, before they add air to it, they very slow. Air, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so mine is 9.1%. Yeah. Um, 56 IBUs. So should be pretty good. Pretty Imperial milk stout. It's, so we're kind of on the same page today, Jonathan. How many ABV? What's the ABV? 9.1. Oof. It's a little strong, but hey. It is. It's all right. So yeah, let's let's uh, toast it up. Awesome. Thank Yes. Raise a glass. Oh, wrong, wrong button. button. There we go. <laughs> yeah, let's do that one more time. Okay. There we go. There we go. Uh, I've got this soundboard, David, and I changed all my labels this week. Uh oh. Uh, so it's a little confusing because I mean, applause added... is not bad for toast, right? <laughs> I mean, that's not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, I've relabeled everything on this board, so I got to get used to it. Yeah. Um, a little house cleaning. Plus, you just got back from the beach, so you're. Yeah, he's, he's a new man. You know. Once yeah. yeah. Rearrange the yeah, soundboard. Yeah, I'm a. Uh, are you a baseball fan, uh, David? Not, not not since the the senators left Washington sixty four. No. Okay. All right. Been a while. Hard well, um, I think I'm going to no longer be a baseball fan after last week. So I try living with a Phillies fan in your house. <laughs> <laughs> That's brutal. I would yes. I would definitely turn to Canadian League football um, if I had to do that. Yeah. So at least I'm not a Dallas game. Cowboys fan. So oh. Oh. <laughs> that's good. You know, then it'd be really rough. It'd be year round almost. So <laughs> I did, I did convert her from Penn state to Georgia. So that's, that's something. That's but, good. Yeah. That yeah. works. So anyway, so David, uh, I noticed you've got a couple of, uh, a couple of electric guitars behind. I, I assume you're, you're, you play quite often. No, I'm um, okay. I, I used to, <laughs> and just, now I, I, I collect guitars, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. All I right. mean, I, I wish I played, but I just don't want to. I don't have time to. I, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm impatient. I'm not, not good enough for the amount of work that it takes to... That's fascinating. So you collect them, right? Well, after I ended up buying about 15 of them, I had to come up with a name for what I was doing, and it wasn't <laughs> buying them more often than I was picking one up. So I had to come up with a way to describe it. Do you buy them and keep them, or do you buy them and re uh, like? Yeah, uh, I just keep them. I like having okay. them around. Okay, yeah, that's it's awesome. Nice art, right? Good art. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's definitely it's um, what do you, what do you call it? Uh, what do you call that thing that you keep the guitars in? It's like a shell, like a case. I don't. Anyway, it's not wall art. It's but it's floor art. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like little sculptures around the house. 
I like do you that. have any? Do you have any famous guitars from any? Uh... Well, yeah. Um, I don't know if you can. See, you see the one with the gold? That's that's George Harrison's uh, Gretsch. Oh wow! Oh wow! Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's pretty famous. One. Yeah, that's that's probably my most famous. And it's the most beautiful guitar that I have. Those are gorgeous back there. Yeah, they look great. Very nice. Um, I bought a a semi hollow Les Paul. Mm-hmm. They it, apparently Gibson discontinued them and it, it seemed like a cool idea but it, it wasn't such a great guitar I've, I've i've tried just about everything but i don't know i i probably should have instead of buying one guitar i should have bought a mesa boogie amp so i could get the sound that i was looking for <laughs> but, you know I'm, I'm busy with other stuff and yeah. neighbors I, I mean i live in san francisco and mm-hmm. you know to, to crank it up plus I'm, I, I don't really want hearing loss. Have you noticed how many rock stars and producers <laughs> have hearing loss now? How, how about, you know, while we're talking about music and then we'll get into the book, but I think today the Stones came out with a new, brand new album, all original music. Are you kidding? Yeah. They've been touring for 60 years and they came out with. Well, yeah, that, that's, that's the thing. I mean, I saw yet another stupid article on Apple News about Warren Buffett has four words that describe success and the words are do what you love, you know, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but I mean, Yawn. these guys love doing it, you know, yeah. and once you start doing it, you get applause and money and nookie. I mean, it. why, why stop, you know? Yeah. I, I think, mean, look uh, at Mick Jagger. He's doing something right. Um, 80 that guy's old. like, huh? He's 80. He's 80. Yeah. And he's still going. I don't know yeah. what it is. Yeah, so uh, yeah, they're. Um, I think they said 179 million a year or something was what they made last year on tour. Well, is eight, is that, eighty. Uh, that's now. it. Yeah, <laughs> <Chicken Little. laughs> yeah. And brand new album, original music dropped today. I think so. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty cool. I, have you noticed, David? And you've talked to a lot of copywriters over the years. Mm-hmm. There's a fair number, like an outsized number, I think, that are musicians or interested <clears throat> in music. A, a, a lot, and you know, some of my closest friends in the business like john carlton and he used to play in a bar band i mean Mm -hmm. a bar band with bikers where fights would break out and stuff you know that kind of bar band oh man those are those are great story um hey clayton would probably be in that would have been in that (laughs) as well i'm I'm not sure he would have been on the stage or you know in the fight definitely in the bar though in the in the the bar for sure yeah um and you know david deutsch is a a musician uh paris lampropolis I think John oh, Ford. John Ford. Well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there there is something, and you know, I've I've tried for the last seven years, which is why I originally picked up a guitar and started taking lessons and working. With, even created an album, which I was so ashamed of it after it was done. I just decided to <laughs> never let it be seen. But I, I really tried, and um, there there is something so entirely different about music, and there there are so many crossovers too. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's the emotion, there's the rhythm, yeah. um, there's that, um, that sort of sense of, you know, crescendo climax and, and denouement, all those things, um, mm. are, are similar to, to copy. I think. I think so too. I've never been able to play an instrument. I mean, the only thing I can play is the radio if somebody else tunes it for me, but like <laughs> right, right as much as I get, you know, so, yeah. um, so but I have things. noticed an outsized number seems like a, of uh, the copywriter population. Uh, a, a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I, I have a client, Doug Pugh, who has a PhD in musical composition, had an opera that he wrote, performed at the Kennedy center. He actually made it to Carnegie hall, not him. His music was played. I mean, and he's a very good copywriter. And yeah, I, I, I wish I could just say, yes, here's why, Sean. It, yeah, I, yeah. I can't say that because I don't know. Um, but there, there's definitely a real cross. And we've we've talked about it a lot. He's even been in my podcast and talked about the music of copywriting and all those things. Yeah. But um, there's a there, similarity. Yeah. A good, a good, I would say a lot, most copywriters come from, have some type of creativity or have come from a creative background, whether it's writing, whether it's art, whether it's music. I definitely think there's a talent involved. I mean, I I think it's a skill for sure, like a learned language. Mike Palmer told me when he was my coffee chief, it's like like a second language. Like you have Mm -hmm. to, 
you know, and the more often you use it, the more fluent you are, you know, the more nuance you understand. Right. But it is a learnable skill. But I do think at the same time, there's a natural bent and talent um, underlying that, whether it's that rhythm, that sure ability to notice when a phrase is good or hear when a phrase is good or, you know, whatever. I think that's. But I think, I think you can have a lot of talent and still be missing a, a lot of mm -hmm. inline specific mm -hmm. knowledge. For sure. Mm -hmm. there, there, you know, there, there are so many nuances and details and sometimes people with a lot of experience come to me to get a critique done and there's like something they just missed out on. And once yeah. I pointed out to them and go, oh, yeah, right. Of course. Yeah. But it's, you know, I, I, I like to say that, you know, like an air, airplane pilot has a checklist. Mm -hmm. um, well, copywriting has a checklist too. It's just nobody knows what's on it. It, it just, it never ends. It just goes on and on and on. Um, the Doberman Dan had a really good checklist that he used to use as a kind of opt-in. It was like a 57 point checklist, you know, that was kind of the same idea. Here's your pre, you know, your yeah. copy checklist. Once you've written, right. you just have all of these things in it. And it takes a lot of discipline to go back and, and actually check off the checklist, you know? It does. I mean, you know. the plane's not going to crash. I mean, you, you, the promo may <laughs> crash, but nobody dies. They lose a lot of money, but nobody dies. <laughs> well, after you've put all of your heart and soul and energy and then your attachment, your will, your pride into something, it takes some real humility to go back and say, okay, what's wrong with it? Where did mm -hmm. I screw up? What did I miss? What was Kill your I darlings, missed? right? Yeah. yeah, Stephen King would say. <laughs> so, let's uh, let's talk about your book, David. That's okay. why you're on the show. Um, sure. I think Jonathan picked this up before I did. I think I saw it on LinkedIn. I mentioned to Jonathan, and he mm -hmm. immediately grabbed it. I procrastinated. I got mine last week and plowed through it. Um, I'm an impulsive yeah. uh, person. But it's my favorite kind of buyer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the persuasion story code, the magic of conversational storytelling. Uh, what do you, what do you want to, how do you want to kick off what this book is about and why it came about? David? Sure. Well, I want, I've been wanting to write a book about stories for a long time. And, you know, I started out, here's where I started out. I started out with, I'm going to write a book about stories and I'm not sure I have that much new to say. And I, I, I really, that really was, uh, I'm not being sarcastic. I, that's just where I was. I believe, um, it. I mean, to be honest, David, like I was like, ah, oh, another book about story. You know, I was like, yeah, All right, let's look okay. at it. But the way you broke down stories, which we'll get into later is I've well, never seen them quite broken down like this. Yeah. I, I, I don't think anyone else has. I, I think I came up with something new. I I give a lot of credit to my coach for pushing me. Mm -hmm. I, I've never been so uncomfortable in an ideation phase mm -hmm. as I was just realizing, no, there was more, 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 there was more. And um, after a while, you know, I, I'd, ha I'd had a lot of thoughts for a long time because I've been writing stories, not lots of them, but some that got published, won, won an award from Post Serial when I was eight years old. So that's a long time. And then wow. I've been writing stories as a journalist professionally, um, did that for about 10, 15 years, and mm -hmm. then writing stories in copy. I'd also parallel track i'd been studying screenwriting and improv and playwriting and fiction and things like that for a long time I, at one point i thought i might want to be a a screenwriter until i saw how the sausage was made you, you know <laughs> um i i, I went down like to long writing too <laughs> <laughs> oh there, there's there's yeah i mean there's nothing quite as repugnant to me as the Hollywood business process. Um, just, yes. I mean, some people can put up with it. I, I couldn't, I'm kind of a, you know, a solitary person anyway. And I guess a lot of screenwriters are, but what you have to go through between the time 
you you get your contract in the time the movie gets made was was different from something I was willing to put up with. But I learned so much because you know, you, you know, you think you have a lot on the line with a promo. Yeah. I mean, imagine you've got a hundred million dollars, two hundred million dollars of someone else's money put into a movie, and you've got about thirty seconds for someone else to tell a story about the movie, to get enough people to come see it, to start a wave, to right. make it a blockbuster, you know? So it's a very high risk um, business. And as a result, there's a, a lot of pressure and, and stuff, but, but because of that, they have, you know, studied human nature and story and, character and psychology and everything else um like nobody else and you know um paul simon has a line the smartest people in the world were gathered in los angeles to diagnose our love lives and tell us what was wrong with us or something like that i mean <laughs> right you know uh, uh and and that's a paraphrase i know i didn't get the yeah. words exactly right um so but by so, the way have you seen did you see, I, I watched this movie last week on a <laughs> it's it's been out a while but argo it's the one where they actually made a fake movie um oh yeah to go in and rescue ben affleck to go in and yeah rescue. To, to go in and rescue the hostages that were or the people that were over in the um it's iran right yeah, it was back in back in the late seventies during the yeah. Carter administration. Yeah, oh, I never I never saw that. Wow. They made a fake. Li they literally made a fake movie or created a fake um, this whole screenplay for a fake movie that they were going to film over in Iran, and they went over office, there. The whole bit, yeah. It was all it was all a big fake charade just to you know it, as a plan to get these hostages out. But it was fascinating because it reminded me of of your, your whole you know, talking about, you know, the Hollywood, the way Hollywood works. And, you know, he went and pitched, you know, I guess a producer and a screenwriter in Hollywood talking about the whole idea of like creating a fake, you know, a fake movie, you know, that was filmed over there that wasn't really going to be filmed, but it was whole, it was all a big, you yeah. know, it, it was all completely fake. So, but that's what Hollywood is. It's fake. So, <laughs> so it's perfect. Fake. It worked out great. Yep. <laughs> Reminds me of Borat a little bit. And all of yeah, that. that's <laughs> right, Borat. Um, anyway, at, at, at some point, you know, I, I went through the pain of, yeah. of, of realizing what I wanted to say. And I'd, I'd had a chip on my shoulder for, and I still do, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, that, um, uh, you know, so, okay, Joseph Campbell, 1949, comes up with the idea of the hero's journey, and it kind of wends its way into popular culture, and then into all of the screenwriting seminars in Hollywood, and yeah, there's there's a lot to it. Um, he, I think he really found some good stuff, and for some reason, uh, there are people, marketing gurus, people with million dollar mastermind say the hero's journey is the only story you should use and yeah. i should say so are you saying a movie is the only thing entrepreneurs should sell ever any right or a novel because it like doesn't fit doesn't doesn't work and that that annoyed me and i started to you know long before i was working on the book i started to look at the actual stories and I've been looking at this on and off for 20 years um, <clears throat> that that people were using to sell. I mean, one thing that's that's not in the book, but I, so either of you guys, both of you guys know who Ben Feldman, the insurance salesman was? I don't know, actually. He was supposedly the, sold more life insurance policies than anyone else. Um, he's long gone now, but... Uh, he was quite a great salesman and he told he would tell this story trying to sell life insurance you know life insurance is if you're in sales it's very hard to sell yeah. because in order to sell it you have to get your prospect to accept something everyone in the world is in denial about that yes. you're going to die yeah. right that's kind of hard to so 
<laughs> he told this story, and this is like the perfect example. It's not a hero's journey story. It's a it's a persuasion story, though. He says, I was um, talking to somebody the other day. He had a, an office high up in an office tower, and we were looking out the window, and there were some men um, in a graveyard that you could see in a graveyard, and they were actually digging a grave. And the comment was made, you know, they're not practicing. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's such a great story. Boom, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah I'm going to be in one of those one day. I, maybe I yeah. better do something for my family. So um, I, that's that's kind of how it came about. And then when, once I really started working on it, I mean, it was really hard getting started. But um, I realized... I know all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know, it's it's like any other creative creative uh, endeavor. And of course, this is the problem so many people have coming to me when I'm doing a critique or when I'm talking to friends, but about their own projects. But it, it was also my problem with this, and that is creating the right frame for it. You right. know, figure figuring out what it is because i i knew most of the things that are in that book before i figured out how to do it it was figuring out how to do it that was like the painful part yeah. did you find that you had just kind of instinctively used a lot of these stories and then you just when you wrote the book you had to categorize them and mm. oh yeah examples y yeah i mean yeah i i do or i i'd seen other people use them I mean, I've critiqued so much of other people's copy, so I've I've seen what they do, and I, you know, when I when I mentor people, we go back over old ads, um, you know, uh, 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 Joe Carbo or, mm -hmm. um, what you know, they laughed when I sat down at the piano, yeah, um, stuff, and 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 a lot of stuff, and. Gary Halbert stuff and John Carlton stuff. And they're just filled with stories. And you know, the, the funny thing is, um, once I started working on this book, I started watching a lot more Netflix and Amazon Prime. Um, just, and I think I just needed an excuse and this was a really good one, you know? Yeah. But um, I, I've, I mean, I've learned things from, from movies that definitely work in, in persuasion stories to add a little bit of excitement, a little bit of intrigue, a little bit of a twist, which they do at the, like I, I just watched the entire season series of the wire about. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, right. Right. It's a yeah. great series. Yeah. yeah. I lived and, in Baltimore for a year and lived, mm. wire, it's all the wire. And uh, oh yeah. Too close and too personal. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it, it's it a rough city. Frighteningly realistic which is one of the things that made it so great. But I noticed that, you know, it's a very different kind of presentation from most TV or movies. And they would have each scene of about four minutes, five minutes. And at the end of the scene, there would be a very, very discernible emotional jolt of some sort. Yeah. Otherwise, it would just be everyday life boring, you know. And right. then I realized that's what they're doing in TV. It's just it's so formulaic and cliched. It doesn't work a lot of the time. It just mm -hmm. checks a box because they're just grinding out scripts. I mean, yeah. well, they even do it on my wife and I have noticed like they even do it on HGTV and a lot of these sh like shows. Like we can now, we've noticed that at like 20 minutes or 23 minutes, whatever that commercial break is right there, mm -hmm. there's always like a problem that pops up. Like, yeah. oh no, the pipes are about to bust. The, <laughs> we found a sewage problem. Like, and then they go to a commercial break right before, you know, and then they come back and it was like, you know, they set it up like it was going to be a $10,000 problem. Yeah. And it comes back and it's like, oh, it was just a quick fix. I'm not big <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. I was like, dang, they got us again. Like, yeah. <laughs> Every time. But it's like, like clockwork at like mm -hmm. 20 minutes in the program of an hour show, they pull yeah, out this little piece of like conflict and drama and, you know, mm -hmm. so like the three act play. The that, that, that's the difference between professional writing that engages, whether it's HGTV or The Wire or a sales letter or, you know, I mean, even 
I don't watch these, but um, uh, my partner on on uh, Copywriters Podcast, um, I guess he watches them with his daughter a lot. And there'll be the 30 second um, uh, TikTok videos, TikTok reels. And, and someone says, you know, they have this problem or they say, look what I can do with this pencil. And then they do something really unexpected. I mean, you know, the ability to create surprise, delight, um, um, just, just like you're talking about, you know, unexpected, something unexpected, but also that where you've got a person engaged, where they are, they're believing that the problem is going to be a lot worse along with you than it is. And then the shared excitement, relief, delight yes. when it isn't that yeah. that's, that's what makes for all good stories. Um, yeah. and and that's why we like them because we, yeah. we get to go in that emotional roller coaster vicariously without having to live through a ten thousand dollar plumbing problem. Exactly. <laughs> Speaking of your podcast, we just had one of our our listeners say, "David, you have a great podcast. One of the best ad openers I borrowed from one of your guests was this is a love story. No, this is a revenge <laughs> story. <laughs> I, re- I, I remember. I wish I could. Do you remember who? I I, I remember that, but." Uh, my mind goes blank as if it was. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, let us know. Let us know. Uh, you're showing up as Facebook user. Um, let us know who's saying this and which episode that was. We'll pass yeah. it on. Th- well, anyway, thank you for the compliment. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. So you problem. broke down the persu- the persuasion story code in your book. You've got. At first, I thought it was going to be like six stories. They ended up being. Do you know how many are actually in the book? I was going to count. Well, there, there's 25 types of stories, but they okay. fall into six categories, right? Because mm-hmm. originally I was like, "Oh, we'll have six story types," and as I, as I was reading, I was like, "Holy crap!" There's like four or five. For <laughs> let each me one. let me ask you a question. Did it overwhelm you? Was it like too much? No, no. no I was no, it was not actually at all. It was a pleasant surprise, like mm-hmm. the nuance of it and things like that. Um, Cause I was like, why is the subtitle not six story types? Cause it, you know, yeah. it should have a number in it. <laughs> right. Right. And then I got in as like, Oh, 25, that would have been too much in a subtitle. So yeah, no, nobody would have believed it. They thought, right. oh, it's, it's crap. Yeah. yeah. So it was a nice surprise when I got in there to see that each chapter had, you know, four, five different types of stories hmm. in that category. So that was definitely a nice surprise. And, and the nuance was like, I guess I could see where to use the different types of story. So, um, yeah, how did, how did that come across? You said, I know you said with your coach, you kind of had to get it pulled out of you a little bit. Um, how did you identify the six categories and then how did you expand beyond that? You know what I, I ultimately did. So, so the categories are, um, you know, the first one's origin stories and then, um, stories about what your prospect is experiencing and stories that predict the future. So that one was like past, present, yeah. and future, right? Origin okay. stories of the past, yep. stories about what your prospect is experiencing the current moment and future. And then the other ones were um, stories that really don't seem like stories, reassurance stories. Um, I think that is huge right now. I've been noticing that when I write copy and just even with myself with the amount of offers that the average person sees in a day and the the number of things that maybe didn't work or bad choices people have made, I feel like reassurance stories are huge right now. I think they always have been, but I think right now well, with skepticism, they, really they, high. They, they are, I mean, a, a lot of, you know, what, one of the reassurance stories is just to reassure someone that I'm introducing you a new idea, but, it's okay because it's really like this old idea, but with these problems fixed and these improvements Yeah, yeah. and people are basically scared of new stuff. They're mm-hmm. scared of it. And, um, right now, um, you know, wherever you are on the political spectrum, whatever country you're in, wherever you are on the financial ladder, this is a very unstable, scary time. Yeah. I mean, we're, in i don't know I, did you guys read the fourth turning pretty oh, interesting yes. book i've read I mean, it i don't know if jonathan read i mean it, we're yeah. we're we're in that we're, we're in, in peak, peak chaos in, in, the, in the fourth fourth one right now and we don't um, know it, which way it's going to go you know if you no, we don't <laughs> otherwise we'd be oh, okay we'll just wait till the little storm's yeah. over then it'd be sunny days or 
Well, this is apocalypse Armageddon. I don't know. Um, but so um, it, 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 for example, maybe 20, 30 years ago, yeah, there was a lot of change. Technology was scary, terrorism, number of other things. But there were sort of these institutions. There was set agreed upon set of facts that the right and the left politically agreed on. There was the Supreme Court and the Congress. There mm -hmm. was, you know, the schools and the churches and the temples. And now it's all, it's all, it's not all gone, but yeah. it's like nobody agrees on anything. And <clears throat> so when, when you don't have standard reference points, my feeling is it's probably going to devolve to, not devolve, but like boil down to an individual. It's mm -hmm. like the 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 area of trust. You can't you can't say, well, I worked at Agora, so therefore you can trust me because Agora is an institution which at one point was kind of unquestioned and now is not where it used to be. Um, and I didn't mean to pick on Agora. I mean you can say, well, I'm a U.S. senator, or well, I'm a um, you know a school or teacher whatever, or yeah, a pastor or whatever. Um, that, that doesn't work anymore. It's got to be who are you that I can trust. And so in, in, a, in a weird sense, we're in the era of the personal ever more than before. And a, a, reassuring, a reassurance story can really help. I mean, Jonathan, can I ask you a question? Yeah. You're, you're in industrial sales, right? So you're going out to meet with people. Are, are you finding prospects, including ones who've known you for a while, are just a little more on edge, a little more cautious. Absolutely. Um, and require yeah. just a little more hand holding than yeah. in the past. Yeah, it, it feels like ever since uh COVID, things the trust factor has uh has really yeah, that, you know that, that shook that, a lot of institutions depending it did. It on did. both sides. You know, what, <clears throat> yeah, yeah it was like it. COVID was like a neutron bomb, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like all the buildings are gone, the people are still here, not all right. of them, but um, so it's it's yeah it, it's a it's a challenging time because people you know post covid not only is it <clears throat> i think there's a trust factor but there's also um you know the ability to the ability for face-to-face -face conversations uh is more challenging today more than ever just because companies i think for the most part uh got really accustomed to the virtual type settings and so you know i'm i, I love the face-to-face -face. i love i've you know that's that's kind of the thing that i've always enjoyed about the sales process is conversation storytelling meeting people um face-to-face -face, giving you know in-person presentations which is more challenging than ever you know now so there's a trust factor you know there's a big, big barrier right there with the uh, the virtual uh chasm right there and then and then you've got the trust factor on top of that so it's hard to meet the buyer's agent if he's working from his home office <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah that's right no one exactly no one is in an office anymore everyone is yeah. working remotely so well, i'd say for <clears> me david like I've noticed with myself in the category of reassurance that I, I doubt my own ability to, to make a good decision because I've been wrong about some things, or I think I've been wrong about some things. I'm not sure if I'm wrong about some things just because everything is in flux, mm -hmm. you know, institution, whether it's religion or politics or whatever, there's been so much foundation shifting that I even question my own judgment at, at, at points. And I'm like, all right, is it, is it the product? Is it the offer? Is it me? Like, you <laughs> yeah. know, I don't even trust myself in some situations. So I need that yeah. reassurance. This and some of the other stories, like, you know, that understand, hey, you're feeling this way. Mm -hmm. You know, when people do that well. Oh, 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 yeah. Well, what what I realized is that some people are very good at making sincere and accurate, empathetic statements and actually. Those are stories too. Mm -hmm. they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're not a once upon a time stories with a beginning, mm -hmm. a middle, and end, but or right. a protagonist necessarily. They're just like it, it 
I mean, they. I think they're maybe slightly more evolved version of what we used to call the feel felt found uh, yeah. story. Right. And that's that's the what your prospect is experiencing, right? Uh huh. Yeah. 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 And, and if you, if you can tell people that you, you understand and, and there, there are, there are realities that um, we all know about, uh, we all experience, we talk about, but we've never really thought about how they would fit into a story. So like, there's a, a kind of story I talk about called stories about pressures from other people. So mm -hmm. for example, Sean, if, if you're kind of doubting a decision, I'm sure you're thinking, oh God, what's my wife going to think about this, <laughs> right? Uh, and and you and every other person who has a wife and every other person who has a boss or a partner or an employee mm -hmm. or a kid or a grandparent. Or, and, and so, you know, to tell a story like that, um, wow, uh, it, it, it can really soothe the nerves. It's funny you mentioned feel, felt, found, because I immediately thought that when I started reading that section. I was like, yeah. oh yeah, this reminds me of like, feel felt found um which is just you know it never stops working i mean it's, it's, yeah you got to know how to use it you know it's it's like anything else if it's if it's too obvious it stops working um, yeah the the basic structure th that three act mini three act play so to speak is kind of i thought more instead of hero's journey i think a lot of copy stories are much more like a three act play than like a hero's journey mm -hmm. there's a quick like up and down you know, and, and I, I like what you said about the, um, a lot of these stories don't have an ending because you're, that's going to be the solution, right? The product that you present and you're, this is earlier in the process. So you're not quite to the solution yet. Yeah. And I, I'm, I might've come down too hard on, on the hero's journey, <laughs> but I, 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 I think it's, it's important when, when you've got to break a mold because yeah. there are, there, I heard yesterday about somebody who's running a very high level business program who's telling his people that the only kind of story they can use is a hero's journey story. And there's a, a lot of that kind of, you know, absolute, absolute thinking. But, you know, if, if you look at the Wall Street Journal story, and I didn't put this in, I, I thought about it, but I thought it might be a little too technical to put in the book, but it's not too technical for this conversation. So, you know, the Wall Street Journal letter, for yeah. any of your listeners or viewers yeah. aren't familiar with it, it's like the most successful sales letter measured of all time, $2 billion. And it was to sell subscriptions to the Wall Street Journal. And it's a very simple letter. It's two pages. It's about two guys um, who on a late spring, summer, early summer, late spring afternoon, um, they're meeting at this alumni reunion at a college and two men meet and they both um they both went to the school 25 years ago and they now both work for the same company and they're both married and they both have kids and the difference is one is the president and one is merely merely a department manager <laughs> and uh and you know and then and then they never go right out and say it, but it's pretty clear they're implying, well, you know, the president read the journal every day and the dummy who's only department manager didn't bother to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He was reading something else. He was reading Hustler <laughs> magazine. <laughs> oh, no. Whoops. <laughs> Oops. Uh, so it, that's not a hero's journey story. You know what a hero's journey story would have been? A hero's journey story would have been this guy um, graduates from this college and the 24th year in, he really thinks he needs to expand his horizons. So he goes on this uh, journey, this adventure to the Andes and he takes some um, ayahuasca and, um, Start seeing all these little guys, sort of guys with round heads and skinny bodies, <laughs> and then um, he gets kidnapped by some bad gorillas, and they're going to start to hold preferred shares of his company stock hostage unless he does X, Y, Z. And then good gorillas capture him, and um, he finally gets flying home. Meanwhile, the company is going into the shitter. It's just not not working out because he hasn't been there. He's been off yeah. on drugs. 
And, uh, <laughs> and, and so he picks up the Wall Street Journal and he learns about this triple buyback option strategy that he can use to not only fool his investors, but improve his, improve his reputation with the board. And he executes it and sales go up, the reputation on the street goes up. And so he shows up at the reunion wearing the native garb of the good gorillas and sharing the wisdom of what he learned on his ayahuasca journey. There you go. The Wall Street Journal. Yeah. There you go. The Wall yeah, that, that would have sold absolutely <laughs> that's, that's zero a hero's copies. Journey that's story. a true hero right there. A true, true hero's heroes. journey. And that would have sold zero copies or almost zero. <laughs> that's, that's true. But I've had a number of people tell me that that movie should get made. And I yeah. always say, yeah, that's by right. someone else. I don't want to have anything to do with those guys. I already told you that. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, probably wouldn't sell subscriptions. So <laughs> no, but yes, that's the point. It would not have sold subscriptions. Yeah. No. It, it might have too... entertained the hell out of these people and yeah. say, Yeah, but I'm, I'm have, not going to burn man to... myself or whatever. Yeah. But that would not work. I think the problem with Hero's Journeys, as I see it, feel free to correct me. Um doesn't feel like that's interruption marketing, which is what most of what we do is. It's we interrupt. So it's got to be a little bit quicker and you can't, you don't have the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you do, if you're really good and you can do a, you know, 20 page sales letter for, you know, financial or health or whatever. Um, but it just feels like here's it, journey. Like you got to be kind of bought in when you go into it. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, the, what we do is a sprint and here's journey is a marathon and what it is usually selling is life lessons and mm -hmm. you know obviously the experience of entertainment mm -hmm. and um you know the, the 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 thrill of of watching an adventure but that has nothing to do with our products unless no. you know now maybe if we're selling adventure travel or something like that or maybe if we're selling religion which is supposed to provide life wisdom but you know um you're selling pens yeah you know if, if you're selling I mean, there, are, mouse, there are some you know. i mean isn't that what i mean i mean you look at advertising today or commercials i mean most of them are following they're buying into the hero but sometimes we forget what the product is right i mean it's a good it may be a good you know it's a good commercial it yeah you know it's good drama i mean hey it's great but you know the problem is we don't know <laughs> We forget sometimes what they're. Yeah, I, I I think TV advertising is probably the the worst example yeah. of persuasion selling mm -hmm. of 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 any of the form I can think of because, and they have a problem. They have to fit in between mm -hmm. the the blocks of what was on the either side of them. You know right. the, the entertainment shows. So there has to be a production value, and there has to be, and the people in the ad agencies really don't have a clue yeah. as to you know how to match what they're doing they're they're very good at whatever something else but yeah you know, i mean they're all about top of mind and that's you know when you need it they're hopefully they're the most recent commercial they, they are but, but but so often they're trying to win awards from their own yeah, industry right. by coming up with something clever yeah i mean sure i don't see even from a deep <clears throat> unconscious point of view you know what an emu with a badge has to do with insurance. I <laughs> Liberty, Liberty. Liberty. Yeah, exactly. Liberty, I, I love those commercials. I find them really amusing. It yeah. doesn't make me want to buy that company's insurance though. No, especially insurance. when the next commercial is flow and progressive. Like, I don't know who to choose. Like I know <laughs> right. such a hard right. choice. It's like right. choosing between two, two real, two friends that are both realtors. Right. It's like, I don't know which one to choose. I'll just go with a third option. Yeah. So I don't offend anybody. Yeah, so the it's third like option is I I buy the house without an agent. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So tell me, um, David, as you were compiling this, what surprised you most? Like, was there a story type that kind of most surprised you and kind of jumped out at you that you kind of overlooked or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, so I mean. Most of these stories, I, I kind of had a vague idea about. I might not have had a name for them, you know. Origin stories, stories that predict the future. Um, uh, uh, you know, testimonials, which you know I put in the category 
called Stories to Build Trust. I think the one that surprised me the most was Stories that Explain, particularly. That was my favorite. Was it? Yeah, that just because sense. because the of the, yeah. yeah, being in the field that I'm in, um, you know, one of my favorite, and I was, I was telling this last week, I was just talking about the, you know, the old Claude Hopkins, Slitz beer, um, you know, which I don't think he featured that, but it, you know, it's a great example of, you know, explaining the process, which nobody, I mean, like nobody does well. Are very Nobody does do it well. well, right? Exactly, and everybody's like, "Well, everybody's doing it that way." Well, you're not telling the story of why you're doing it that way. You know, that was Claude Hopkins when he did. You know, when he was hired by Slitz Beer, he's yes. Like, well, we amazing. we steam clean the bottles four <laughs> times, so right. they're clean. Yeah. yeah. Well, so does everybody else. No, I, I was talking to a client this week um, in the financial space, and. He has um, a particular thing that he does at the beginning of his day. Mm -hmm. And um, I, he, he said, everybody does that. And I said, no, no. <laughs> right. In a court of law, everybody does that. In yeah. marketing, you're the one who does that. You're right. the only one who does that. Mm -hmm. If you own it, if you claim it, then it's yours. Yeah. You can't say no one else does that. You can say, I'm the one who does that. Um, you can even say I'm the only one who does that and because and put a little little twist in it so it's it's proprietary. But yeah, I mean, people it doesn't occur to people to tell a story about what they do mm -hmm. without exaggerating, without making it glamorous or sexy or just to make it intriguing right. and 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 tell it in such a way that it indicates a benefit to your prospect and um and and that they learn something new that they find interesting and yeah. and it can help you close the sale yeah i mean it's kind of a form of demonstration i think it was ogilvy that said demonstration is, is one of the most powerful forms of advertising mm -hmm. you know i think yeah. it's, a, it's a written form of you know if you don't have a commercial like a bounty you know quicker picker up or wipe up the the mm -hmm. red goo or you know a diaper commercial where you wipe up the blue goo like in copy you've got to do that with with words yeah and i think that's that's why it's so powerful because it is a form of demonstration and mm -hmm. demonstration is just just works i mean it works time and time again if you can figure out a way to put that in copy yep. yeah absolutely and so you know i i break it down for people and where did i hide it here um if you if you have a laser printer at home and you buy the book you can get at the end of the book there's a link for templates um yep. and let me call it a cheat sheet and i've broken it down um I'll give you an example um, qualifications track record story uh, when to use it how to craft it four steps and boom there you go and, and, and you got a template to do. And I, I did that for every story. So um, I think it's very hard for a lot of people to write stories. So it's hard for people to write. And they don't know how a story is supposed to go together. So I, I, you know, once I got started, I really got into this. I wanted to make it as accessible for n not people who are never going to use it, but people who are in a position where they already have to persuade and they really yeah maybe they even have stories but they you know they've memorized two or three stories they'd like to develop some more i mean it's yeah. not that i mean you're you're not a copywriter jonathan but obviously you're a word guy in a way i mean you talk for a living um yeah did did you find you were able to uh, create stories from from what you found in the book yeah absolutely yeah, I mean it's a great uh, template. And then, you know, the uh, my other favorite chapter was the stories to build trust. You know, that's a big, um, you know, those are so powerful. Uh, you got to, I mean, that's more important. Like we were talking, more important than ever for uh, the people that I work with or the people that I sell to. Uh, trust is a huge factor. Um, you know, because I, I mean, I. Typically, the audience that I sell to are typically the technical and engineers. So, 
you know, some of the uh, some of the stories or the traditional uh, or what we call the um, hero's journey stories just don't. Sometimes they don't cut it. You know? <laughs> they're so, they're they're not going to have patience for them. They're no. like, get to the point, dude. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, Sean's known this for years. I've always been, um, you know, I've kind of been one of those followers. You know, Bob Bly is one of those guys. We've had him on the show a couple of times. Where, mm -hmm. you know, he's. I think he started out as a chemical engineer. You yep. know, he's one of the few that's like didn't follow the creative path into copywriting. He's a chemical engineer, but you know he you know, he's, he's been a great copywriter. So, um, you know, those are, you know, those are things like the, the, the hero's journey. Uh, I think there's a time and place for those, but, um, you know, to your point, the, the guy that said that's the only <laughs> story that you should tell is, uh, I, I gotta, I gotta, you know, say that that's, that's not, that wouldn't work in my field. So. Yeah. And, and, even even if you're not in the technical field, I mean, if you're in the restaurant supply business and you're going in, you're talking to a chef about a new meat cutter, and he said, "How does this work?" You know, he's not going <laughs> to. Well, in the he forges was. of Pittsburgh, <laughs> where they make right. you know, no. Uh, well, yeah. uh, we had a guy the other day, and he he needed to adjust it, and he did this and this, and that's how it worked. You know, yeah. And th and that's a story about how it works. I mean. Right. Um, it's not that we don't already know how to do this. It's mm -hmm. that sometimes we're not aware of it when we do do it. Most of the times people are not aware of telling stories. It's just answering a question or making a point. But knowing how to do it intentionally really broadens your options. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the, being able to do it intentionally, I think that's what this book really really does. It gives you, especially the cheat sheet, I downloaded the cheat sheet. Um, so definitely be using that, but yeah, definitely to be able to go back on your checklist or kind of, if you're stuck for like, Oh, I know it needs something here. Like what's missing as far as the type of proof. Cause these are, I mean, all stories are basically a form of proof. Mm -hmm. Um, like what, what type of proof do I need here? Do I need to somebody to resonate and like, trust me, do I, all the, you've know, got them laid out perfectly. So I, I really like that. And I'd rather have, I mean, you need statistics and things like that, depending on what you're writing, but you know, stories, stories are great. And we probably don't put enough little mini stories in copy, um, because we, we want to put in statistics or, or quotes and even quotes tend to be, they're basically little mini stories if you use them well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I, I showed is how you can turn, um, the mention of a certification by changing a few words into a, a mini story. Um, yeah. You can, um, with permission, change a quote so it's arranged even two or three sentences into a story. And yeah. um, I, I think a, a lot of this comes from having studied this so much and, and having done so much of it and having helped other people with it so much. Um, but I, I just tend to think that way. You know, we actually, we, we don't think in words, we think in pictures. And yeah. um, so the, one of the best ways to communicate a series of images is with a story that's written in, in uh, visual language. Yeah, I think that's another thing that a lot of people miss. And that's, you know, that's the other book by Eugene Schwartz, The Brilliance oh, Breakthrough. Oh, The Brilliance Breakthrough? that really hammers that home in like a oh, yeah. book. pure yeah. textbook fashion. Um, that is, that's what, that's when I read that, I was like, yep, that's, that's the thing. Like that's, that's where you really have to practice because it's so easy to, to, to default when you're busy or you're tired or you're trying to get a project done. It's kind of easy well, to, to yeah. default. I mean, the, the problem is especially writers, but people think in words, yeah, you yeah. know? And so, yeah, I, I think I, I, I read something about Steven Spielberg. I mean, there are a lot of things about movies and movie industry I like, just not working in it, you understand? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, apparently, I saw this documentary about him. Apparently, someone said he is better at taking a particular story and visualizing exactly how to present it image by image, scene by scene, shot by shot. And there was, when I first 
uh, started consulting to Agora. Joe Shriver brought me in and asked me to give a presentation. And there's this interesting book called Shoot Your Novel. And it's not about shoot your novel. It's about shoot your novel. Mm. It's about um, think of your novel in terms of a series of scenes out of a screenplay. And yeah. it's written by this woman who's a novelist whose mother was a, um, a Hollywood agent. And so she grew up with all these scripts around the house. So she was reading them at six years old, you know, hopefully not the R-rated ones yet. <laughs> and, um, she So it, it, it was about how to write more visually. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I, I love Brilliant Breakthrough. I have some of my clients um, actually work through it and I've worked through the whole thing, all the exercises myself. Yeah, it, it, it's really wonderful. That's also obviously what you learn as a screenwriter. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a very good skill to, to imagine something from a visual perspective. Yeah. I think that's, you know, as we're saying this, I hadn't thought about this before, but as we're talking here, it, it makes me think that maybe that's why Marvel has been so successful is because they literally, it was visual before they put a script to it, right? The script was very minuscule. And then you have the blocks of, of action and imagery and all that stuff. So it was much easier. I would imagine to convert that to a movie mm -hmm. because it was kind of already there. And that's what storyboards are. You know, I think, yeah, I mean, the comic book is just a detailed storyboard for a movie, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. that's, that's such a great point, Sean. I never thought I wonder of if that. like, I wonder if there's yeah. a way to, to write a sales letter as a storyboard first, you know, and to really up that, visualness factor i'm That's sure there an is interesting idea well, yeah yeah, yeah i was reading i think it was last week i was reading speaking of comic books where they were the first i think stan lee was the first to say you know he wanted the artist to create the images before they added the story yeah, yeah. I, I saw a documentary about him yeah, i watched and, that too yeah and that was different than what had done previously, how they had done it previously, because it was always the, the guys writing the. I think it, it kind of happened organically because yeah. he couldn't keep up with the text. Right. That's right. And the artists were ahead of him and he were like, yeah, just, just draw <laughs> it and I'll fill in the copy later. You know, it's like, yeah. Cause yeah. He, he rose to the ranks so quick and they lost some of their writers and yeah. He's like, yeah. yeah, just draw it and I'll fill in the, the text. You know, <laughs> that, that kind of changed the world. I think, um, and without us realizing it, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. No, yeah. I mean, I think it, it, it definitely pushed them to be the, you know, preeminent comic above, you know, DC, you know, pushed mm -hmm. them ahead of, and then some of the stories, just the, you know, the personal stories, you know, the personal side of these characters that they were creating. Yeah. That had issues that had problems, you know, Sean and I've talked about this in the past, you know, how, well, you know, how Marvel was always so effective at creating these, you know, well, I mean, heroes, they get, but they had a, a different level to them. They had, you know, they had issues. Right. I mean, <laughs> if personalities. You look at, yeah. If you look at David's stuff, they, they had an origin story, yeah. you know, that was a little deeper, right. They were experiencing the same thing. The movie goer, the comic mm -hmm. book reader was experiencing. Right. Um, you know, yeah. So they, they were just more human. They than, were insecure, so they needed reassurance. Yeah, yeah they, they were definitely more. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Peter more Parker was a pimple faced kid, like like teenager with, <laughs> and then he gets bit by a spider. Oh god! Yes. <laughs> what a life! Right. <laughs> yeah, we were watching exactly. a movie the other night. I think I think it was Jurassic World or something, uh -huh. and. Like they go into the lab and like start spilling stuff. And I was like, see, that's how superheroes get made right there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Makes Absolutely. a couple of chemicals, get stuck in a lab. Yeah, you're exactly. A superhero. So, yep. um, okay. yeah, I mean, this is, this is good stuff. I, I, um, Jonathan, you have any other questions before we start wrapping up or. No, I, I think it's, it's a fantastic read. I would just recommend it. I, you know, I love how you break down all the different, because to me, you know, I think you're one of the few that have, you know, in a book that have kind of laid out the different types of stories um, and kind of organized those in such a way that you, uh, you know, this is this is a little different. This is the one this is the kind of story that I want to tell. Well, I, I really appreciate you saying that because that was my intention. I mean, yeah, I realize so much of the story information out there is for a very small 
few number of people and millions of people who want to be in that very mm -hmm. few small number of people. There yeah. aren't that many best-selling novelists or even people who make a living from their novels. And there aren't that many screenwriters that actually sell movies. There's mm -hmm. only two, 300 movies, 400, 700 movies made a year. Right. And how many people are there who own their own businesses? Yeah. Um, 30 million, 40 million. Yeah. How many professional salespeople are there? 20 million, yeah. 30 million. Absolutely. You know, um, so there are a lot of people who need this who really don't need to write Academy Award winning mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to have conversations that keep the other person listening. Yeah. And how many how many people have spouses they need to convince <laughs> to do what they want? <laughs> Probably more than a few. <laughs> That's you could you could do a spin-off, the relationship story code. Mm -hmm. That's an idea. I'd, I'd have, I, boy, then I'd really have a lot to learn before I could do that one. But that's an idea. I like it. Thank you. You can get a co-author. Get a co-author of some kind. So, well, this has been fun. Um, yeah. Um, who's our, who's our guest? Oh, we've had him on uh, Story Sales Machine, Sean. Oh, Bill Mueller. Yeah, Bill Mueller. We've had him on a, a couple of times, huh? and they, he got me started. Huh. They, you, David, you and uh, Bill, we should introduce the two of you. Do you know oh, Bill Mueller? For sure. I don't Sorry. know him, but I'd like to. Yeah. He's yeah, up he's, in uh, the north Northwest, right? Up in Washington, right? Like Seattle or something. I think so. Um, yeah. But he has a he's story sales machine. He's big on story emails. So he writes yeah. a lot of stories. They're oh, to yeah. be longer stories. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was actually thinking about that. He's, he uses a lot of GIFs and his email copy, you know, mm -hmm. and it just really, it's really cool. Cause it really brings home the point and a, you know, a GIF or a meme is like a, a little mini story all in itself. Yeah. It carries a lot of weight. Kind of the when they're used well, they're words. great. When they're yeah. used awkwardly, they're embarrassing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You, right. Yeah. It's, yep. it's like any other, you know, party trick or, you know, if you don't know when to use humor, it can be really awkward as well. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah we'll, we'll we'll definitely put an intro together. Uh, it'd be a great fit for um, yeah two of you to meet up. Um, yeah, man, this is a great book. I highly recommend people go out on Amazon. The best place to get it. David. Amazon's the best and only place to get it. Okay, good. What about any any other uh, offers or anything else you want to throw out there as far as how people can learn more about you and what you do? Sure. So I've got another book if you, that I wrote a few years ago called um, uh, Breakthrough Copywriting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's not Breakthrough Advertising, it's Breakthrough Copy. If you, if you scroll down just a little bit um, on, on your Amazon page, you'll see yeah. it right there. There you yeah. go. See in the middle? Right yep. there, bought right there. frequently together. So you can click on there if you want to show them the title. So it's frequently bought together, people. Like yeah. if you're gonna buy this, this needs. You gotta to go buy right. all of David's stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Got to get the three pack. Yep. Go ahead and click on. I've that got the advertising. Uh, yeah, let's see it. There we go. There, there they go. you go. Copywriting. Yes. Oh, look um, at that dollar bills on the cover, so you know it's good. <laughs> yes, it's all about <laughs> money. I've even got money in the in the subtitle, right? Uh, yeah. How to how to generate it. quick cash with, with the written, written word. word. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. And then for people who would like to have their copy critiqued or they would like to work with me, I mentor a few people each year, business owners who use copy, a lot of copy, and copywriters mm. who write a lot of copy. Or if you have a website or a script or something, go to garfinkelcoaching.com. Okay. So, all right we'll put that up on the yeah put that in the uh there. show notes for this week thank you guys fantastic uh fantastic book i you know the um the 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 other book you've got headlines on the, oh yeah uh, i forgot to mention advertising, advertising headlines, headlines make you rich yeah uh yeah that's a good one too i've got that one oh. yeah it's that's, it's, that's where it's it really starts. good, even though they're classic headlines, and you you might not want to use them as templates these days. You can learn a lot about the psychology yeah. of of headlines. Mm -hmm. there's, it's, there's a lot of subtlety, and and each one of the those headlines went through all of the road testing and refinement before I ever saw it. Yeah, you know, so um, that one's not my opinion so much as my explanation of some things that test prove work mm -hmm. last yeah. test of time. 
kind of the why behind the the what worked. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. if you swipe some of those and you don't understand why they worked or the context <laughs> of why they worked or the yeah. time in, in, right. in which they worked, you know, it's kind of like reading the Bible. If you don't understand context, you can misunderstand a lot of the a lot of mm-hmm. the nuance that goes on. So, but I, I do explain the context for each yeah. headline in that book. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I found some of those, especially in the more B two B type niches, a lot of those still work. It's when you get into consumer that they don't work as well. They're a little overdone, yeah. but definitely in B two B world, they they still work pretty well. Yeah, and B two B is a really huge, important part of the economy. So, yeah, and it's, it is. <clears throat> if you're a copywriter, the bar is, I think, a lot lower as far as <laughs> like what it takes to to persuade and create sales. Well, there, there's there's another problem with consumer stuff too. And it's not really the copywriter's fault. When when you've got a consumer brand that's publicly traded, your mm-hmm. advertising is only one third sales oriented. Then mm-hmm. then then there's another third which is um political. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, well, did you know Bud Light just went under, just just uh, declared bankruptcy today? Oh, I, I didn't, didn't know, know that, that today. I, I saw that. I saw that in the Apple News. I don't think it was a joke. So, yeah, it's political. And then there's another third, which is, gosh, it's it's not political, but it's, it's kind of tone and brand and mm-hmm. the committee and... The message and uh so it's very very hard to come up with something that gets through all those filters and still sells now right, right. if you're doing consumer run um you know a shopify store or yeah. uh you've got like um like a dr al sears or something like that which is a large private company yeah. a man who owns a large private company um where you don't have all of those considerations weighing on your back it's still hard but yeah it's easier yeah for sure well good stuff um man it's been a pleasure having you on david it's good to catch up um Likewise. we'll catch Always. up a little bit more afterwards um yeah yeah good stuff we're gonna put you in the green room for a little bit and then we'll wrap up and then we'll come right back to you okay well thanks for having me on guys yeah thanks david man good stuff i could go on for hours on that yeah, that's a good book. Yeah. Highly recommend it. If you didn't catch it, Persuasion Story Code, uh, The Magic of Conversational Storytelling, David Garfinkel. And that's. You learned some things on there, Sean. Like, I think we were talking even before the show started. Like, I didn't realize Daniel Webster was such a great yeah. storyteller. But yeah, again, we go back lot. to the. Uh, a lot of those. <laughs> a lot of those pioneers in the early. Uh, part of our country that i mean they these guys were renaissance men um but uh he was a great the the i mean the story that he told to uh you know sell the property i mean that was amazing it's like yeah definitely check it out go grab the book um it's worth every penny of the whatever it costs i don't know what it was um yeah but it's worth it and uh mark it up put it on your desk you know get the highlighter out and uh, use it as and then download the template. So when you get in yeah. there, you'll see there's a template uh, available set of templates that are really good as well. So, right. It's Absolutely. Nice. Yep. And if you don't go ahead and uh, while you're there at, on Amazon, get his breakthrough copywriting, great book and the uh, advertising headlines to make you rich. Just get the whole bundle while you're at it. I mean, yeah. you just can't go wrong there. It's Box good set. stuff. Yep. There you go. Uh, David does some good stuff. But, uh, Sean, it's been fun, man. That was a great interview to all of our listeners. You can find us over at persuasionbythepint.com. By the way, we got to mention, you know, it's been a couple of weeks. Uh, Sean and I have been on a little hiatus. Uh, I was on vacation last week, Sean, uh, the previous week. Um, so I was it's on been a trip a couple- as well. Yep. You were on a trip yeah. and uh, <laughs> you, you were on your, <laughs> you were definitely on a trip. Uh, but you know what? We got a little, um, to, you know, just to throw out, you know, just some shameless, um, you know, uh, hubris there. We can, I guess, share that we, we got what, uh, number two podcast and persuasion on, yes. uh, by somebody we've never heard of. So thank you for those accolades, um, yeah. whoever you are. 
<laughs> I forget the name of the website. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't know either. Um, <laughs> I got a screenshot of it here somewhere. So uh, just we'll, we'll it mention it away. next time around. We'll mention yeah. it next time around. We, just have a guest ne- we actually have a guest next week on PR. So ah, cool, awesome. So I'll send you so, that over. Okay, so we are one of the top rated uh, podcast on persuasion. So yeah. check us out, persuasionbythepike.com. You can find us on all of your podcast platform stitcher radio iheart spotify you name it we're there and uh leave us a few stars namely five we'll say five while you're at it and uh we appreciate it and uh we'll see you all next week we got another fantastic guest coming up uh next next week sean is that what you yep. said yep pr it'll be about pr and kind of just persuasion through the media and the news taking advantage oh. of news trends all that kind of stuff Really? So yeah. taking advantage of news trends, that really happens, right? I mean, yeah, that's what I've heard. <laughs> all right. Take care uh, to all of our listeners. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next time. See ya. All right.